This is, I think, the, one of the most fun things I've seen on Twitter in a while. This is sampling um, whale, uh, they actually call it snot, um, for viruses. This is a drone off the coast of Australia and literally, I think they got something like 30 different whales that they collected the spray from and then isolated viruses from them. Mostly bacteriophage, which is not surprising because of the water that they're involved with. So a lot of that spray, of course, is just the ocean water as well, but also a number of probably whale-specific viruses as well. So um, I just thought this was amazingly cool. Again, I'm slightly biased, as has hopefully become really obvious through the course of the last 10 weeks. So how do I always start my lectures these days? Exactly, I could talk about this all term. <laughs> Particularly true for these archaeal viruses, which we're now done with because we've gone through all of them. Uh, no, this, we're finally getting a chance to talk about probably my favorite virus, the virion of which you can see up here. Um, literally been working on these for almost 20 years. Another virus that I was probably the first person in the world to ever see in the electron microscope. Um, this one here. So again, these are things very near and dear to my heart, as you can, some of you can see from the t-shirt um, that I'm wearing as well, thanks to one of my students who had it made for me. So, but before we get started with you know, the most important and interesting viruses ever, um, some of the other important interesting ones, again, that we could have spent a whole term talking about. Last time, the NCLDVs, in fact, I already put this up incorrectly here, LNCDVs, it just goes to show that I can't remember how to do my acronyms, <laughs> the nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses. So these were the algal viruses, some of the coccolithophore viruses, mini viruses and the megaviruses, and then in terms of virion size, Pandora and pithoviruses, everything at this end is still icosahedrally symmetric. These guys are really bizarre, and certainly in terms of their virion morphologies, and the virophage, not surprising that we have viruses that are infecting viruses. Um, and this is going all the way back to lecture one, again, a mere 10 weeks ago, when we talked about viruses as not being just the virion, but a whole life cycle. And from that point of view, it makes much more sense to think about viruses that can infect something that is going through this whole life cycle. Any questions on these nuclear cytoplasmic large DNA viruses? No, I don't have a clicker question on them. And I will not have clicker questions on Friday either. So you can leave them at home or sell them back to the bookstore. Or if you like, donate them to the biology department so we can loan them out um, next year. Um, I have been really bad speaking about clickers at uploading scores. Probably most of you have noticed that. Um, I have all of the scores. I just haven't uploaded them. I will try and do that in the next couple of days. If I don't, please send me an email and remind me. Uh, there are. I think one or two people um, for whom I don't have a connection between your name and clicker scores. So if you still have zero, um, let me know if you've been appropriately clicking away. So archaeal viruses, again, yes, we could spend all term talking about these. But the sort of take home message here is that the one group of viruses in the Uri archaea, um, these are some of the you know, supposed to be broad different kinds of archaea, including the methanogens, the extreme halophiles, etc. cetera. Um, these almost always look like bacterial viruses. And then we've got these really crazy ones which are infecting the Kren archaea, um, and particularly Sulfolobus and the organisms that me mostly work with. Um, these have incredibly unique virion morphologies and unique genomes, and these are just a couple of the cartoons, again, from Viral Zone, looking at some of these individual um, particles. There, until very recently, I think about four or five years ago, they were all double-stranded DNA viruses, 
We'll talk about one example of a, again, quote unquote, single-stranded DNA virus that's also been found in the archaea. So viruses of Uri archaea, pretty much all phage-like, with some interesting exceptions that, again, we'll spend some time talking about. On the other hand, all the viruses of Cren archaea are pretty new. Um, everything that's been found so far, any kind of new virus turns out to have different morphology, different genome sequences, et cetera. We'll talk about a number of these different families of viruses. So basically, every lecture that we've had till now, with a couple of exceptions, has been one family of viruses. Now we're doing one lecture with at least seven different families of viruses in it. Um, we're going to concentrate on these Fusello viruses, again, because that's what my lab and myself has been working on for far too many years. Um, but also the Rudy viruses and Lipothric viruses, these are filamentous or rod-shaped viruses, globuloviruses, which should be pretty clear, these are spherical viruses, the Ampulloviridae, or the Ampulloviruses, Ampulla is like a bottle shape, and these literally do have virions that look like bottles. Um, Bicauda viridae, cauda is tail, um, so these are two-tailed viruses. There's some really fascinating aspects about these viruses in terms of their change of virion morphology. And then the turiviridae, um, because of the turrets that you find at the five-fold axes of symmetry. Um, I'm particularly interested in these viruses, but basically uh, the ICTV could care less about them. Um, these are all of the viruses of Archaea relative to all of the other viruses that anybody cares about, um, at least the ICTV does. So um, very small group here, but I think um, very, very important. So it's to emphasize where that is here. So why viruses of Archaea? Why did it even bother trying to do this in the first place. Not because I'm incredibly masochistic, it's because they're really fascinating organisms. And understanding the viruses hopefully allows us to understand something about the organisms. So again, this tree that you've seen multiple times before, and if I didn't have this t-shirt, I would have won this particular t-shirt right here that has this tree on it. Uh, the archaea are molecularly very different from bacteria and Eukarya, at first people thought they were only present in really extreme environments. In the last 10 years, we figured out that archaea are really pretty much everywhere. It's just that people haven't had the right tools to look for them. A lot of that's, in fact, been molecular tools that have now been developed in the last 10 to 15 years or so. Um, they are, in some ways, and again, remembering back to that course that I taught last term, molecular biology, um, transcription, replication, very similar to eukaryotic systems um, in terms of their genome arrangement and probably regulation, much more similar to bacteria. Whenever I'm writing grant proposals, it's always about the similarity to eukarya. Uh, whenever I'm talking about them, it's more that archaea are unique and interesting by themselves. Um, they do have these very different lipids compared to all of the other domains of cellular life. Um, and these are ether lipids, and we'll take a look at some of the viral lipids a little bit later on. And they're called the archaea because they may or may not be similar to ancestral organisms. We mostly work with Sulfolobus. It was, in fact, one of the very first of these organisms to have been discovered in Yellowstone National Park high temperature, low pH environment, and it actually dominates in terms of the cultural organisms that you can find there, and of course, you know, poor little us, we're over here. I showed you this slide right at the very beginning. Um, archaeal virions are mostly very different. Um, there are, of course, some exceptions. Uh, this methanogen virus here should look very, very familiar. Um, what does it look familiar to like? So what does it look like, I should say? It's familiar to or look like? Lambda, exactly. So flexible tail, icosahedral head structure. Um, I, this is more the exception than the rule because we have these long filamentous viruses with nano-sized claws 
at the ends of their virions that actually close on the presumptive receptor. We have these globular viruses that really kind of look like blobs. Um, and then STIV, this turreted icosahedrovirus, T equals 31 structure. No, I don't expect you to remember that. Uh, but with these really fascinating projections at the five-fold axis of symmetry, probably the most amazing virion structure, in my opinion, are the Acidionis bottle-shaped viruses, which really do kind of look like a champagne bottle, or as David Goodman put it in his defense, um, kind of like little party poppers that you can you know, pop out, and then you see all of the confetti coming out of one end. Um, these are how you make a structure like this um, at a nanoscale is really completely beyond me. And then these guys that we're going to talk a lot more about um, later on in the course, the Sulfalobus spindle-shaped viruses. This is just one of the virions right here. But first wanted to mention the Uriarchaeal viruses. These are mostly methanogens. These are the only organisms which actually make methane. So if you think about you know, cows producing lots of methane, it's not the cows that are producing methane, it's the methanogens in their rumens that are producing lots of methane. Um, many of these organisms are actually relatively easy to grow if you have them in completely anaerobic conditions, and people found a number of viruses that infected them, including this SIAM1, basically looking in the microscope and saying, hey, hmm, got something that looks like a virus. At the same time, they actually saw particles that look like this and they ignored them for many years because those don't look like viruses are supposed to look. Viruses and virions are supposed to have these heads and tails, but it turns out that these are virions as well. Um, and this spindle-like structure, so the lemon-like structure, we'll see again and again, and it may be something which is specific to archaea, and what that means is still pretty up in the air. Um, extreme halophiles, these were also early isolated archaea. These are the organisms that can grow at saturating salt conditions. Anytime you fly into the San Francisco Bay Area, you'll see all these amazing colors if you look out the window. Um, those are all of the salt pans where they're evaporating all of the salt in order to make wonderful sea salt. Um, but the colors, particularly the higher and higher salt concentrations, are due to pigments present in the archaea. In fact, only the archaea can survive at those very high salt conditions. And these were also called halobacterium for a number of years because they didn't realize that they were archaea. Not surprisingly, just like all organisms, they have viruses associated with them. These are the first virions to be found, um, Phi H for halobium. Number of other viruses that look like pretty classic head and tail bacteriophages. But more recently, actually since studies of the Crenarchaea, where we had these really bizarre virus morphologies, people went back and looked at their micrographs and said, hey, hmm, we've got some things that look like this. We've got some things that look like this that actually turn out to be virions as well. And very recently, I think about three years ago now, um, there was a published cryo-EM structure of this HIS-1 virus that in this wonderful false color image really does look rather lemon-like. Um, turns out that this paper was submitted right after our paper was accepted. So ours is the first one of these lemon-shaped or spindle-shaped viruses. But um, you also, if you look at deep sea hydrothermal vents, um, as Dr. Reisenbach in the biology department here does, and you isolate organisms from those environments, look for virus-like particles, that's what VLP stand for, you'll also see a lot of particles that look like this as well. So this spindle or lemon shape seems to be very well conserved. So that's it for the uriarchaeal viruses. Let's talk about crenarchaeal viruses. Um, why talk about crenarchaeal viruses? Um, because they're really fun to sample. Um, this is a person you may or may not recognize here um, in Yellowstone National Park almost 20 years ago. Uh, this screen, actually the Computer here looks much better. I don't know if you guys can see it at the front here. Uh, this actual hot spring really does look like tomato soup. Um, in 
Yellowstone National Park. The temperature is about 85 degrees Celsius and the pH is about 3.5. It's a little high on the pH range for Sulfolobus, but very near here is a place where we isolated the original Turi virus from and also have found a number of SSVs, these lemon-shaped viruses that we'll be talking about a little bit more. So now I can ask you a clicker question, right? No, I can't ask you a clicker question. It's not allowed. <laughs> so we'll get 100% for everything today, right? No, we're not quite at 100% yet, so talk to your neighbors. I like being convinced. Convinced is good. They don't have the problem. They don't have the certain types of lessons. They don't have lessons. So I'm not sure. But I Did you go with private? Uh private. It's private. Yeah, it does. We're important. We're important. Yeah. Okay, I think we're getting more laughter than discussion, so let's try again. The bride side and the groom side. What's <laughs> that? For. I don't know. Yeah. Come on. Okay. Nobody liked E. coli primates or amoeba. Um, I was actually a little worried about the amoeba question because um, those have the memes and the amphoras and the pithoviruses that are associated with only three and we've got seven different families in the cranarchaea exactly so yes it is the cranarchaea uh, because these also have the bottle shaped viruses they have the two-tailed viruses etc okay so now I want to concentrate on Again, my favorite group of viruses. These are the Fusella viruses. The prototypical one of these viruses is SSV1, the Sulfolobus spindle-shaped virus. 
Um, virions, again, look like this. I'm particularly proud of this TEM because I took it. Um, one of my very first TM images, and of course one of the ones that end up being one of the best. Um, each of these are individual virions. This in the middle here is probably a piece of cellular debris. Um, when you grow these cells, often they'll have vesicles, etc. And sometimes people like to think about these as sort of sunflowers with the virions around the outside. Um, each of these particles has a short tail at one end, so they're asymmetric, but clearly not with an icosahedral structure to them. In this form of electron microscopy, they're about 60 nanometers across by 90 nanometers in length. The genome on the inside is a double-stranded circular genome. So again, very different from the bacteriophage. It's almost always a packaging linear genomes. This one packages a circular genome, but not only is it circular, it's also positively supercoiled. So why would positive supercoiling be a, a good thing? Um, Adam, do you have any ideas why positive supercoiling might be a good idea for a virus like this? Does it help keep the genome intact in the environment? What particular aspect of the environment? The heat or yeah. the extreme part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the extreme heat, what would happen normally with DNA at high temperatures? It would yeah, unwind and particularly denature the two strands come apart. And if you positively supercoil it, it's the overwound. So it helps those space pairs stay together. So it, it makes perfect sense that that's what you would see. This is, in fact, also the very first case that people found of stably, positively supercoiled DNA in an environmental sample. Later, people went back and looked at plasmids that you find in some of the extreme thermophiles. They're also positively supercoiled. And a really nice experiment done by some colleagues in France, they looked at plasmid supercoiling dependent on the growth state, the growth temperature of the cells. The higher growth temperature, the more positive supercoiling they had. Really fascinating experiment. Uh, the double-stranded circular genome, once it comes inside the cell, integrates, and it's a very specific integration that looks like it happens in a very similar way to lambda integrase. And in fact, there's an integrase gene which has sequence similarity to the lambda integrase. Also like lambda, production of the virus is inducible through UV irradiation. There is, however, no obvious SSV1 repressor, which gets degraded on this UV induction. And we really don't know uh, where and how that UV induction process takes place, even though, yes, I've been working on it for 20 years, and people have been working on it for even longer than that. And another important aspect is that this original isolate was from Beppu Onsen in the Uida Prefecture in the Kyushu Island of Japan. Um, and these individual hot spring environments are, as it turns out, one of the places that you find lots and lots of these spindle-shaped viruses. And that has turned out to be really useful in terms of trying to understand um, how they function. But 20 years ago, um, this is basically what we knew about the virus. Um, we knew about these three protein encoding genes, VP1, VP3, and VP2. Again, virus protein, creatively named, and the viral integrase gene. And that was it in terms of the understanding of the rest of the genome. And so we fortunately made a lot of progress since then, um, some of it due to me, some of it due to some of my um, colleagues. And a lot of that actually comes from the really fun aspect of what we do, which is a minuscule amount of it which is taking advantage of the fact that I just mentioned SSV1 is originally from Japan, but pretty much wherever you find volcanic hot springs, you'll find similar looking viruses. And then what you can do is compare the sequences of those viral genomes to each other. So these are three of those locations. This is Iceland, um, including Wolfram Zillig, who is my postdoctoral advisor. It's actually right before I started working on the virus, um, together with David Prangishvili, who's done amazing work with a whole bunch of new viruses, and Ingelora Holtz, who uh, was the partner of Wolfram Zillig for many, many years, also collecting different viruses. Again, this is some hot springs in Iceland. Um, this is when I was doing a postdoc in Yellowstone, actually quite close to that picture where I was sampling from the 
hot spring. Um, this is a really beautiful hot spring to cold dough. It's only about 50 degrees Celsius. Um, and this is Blake Wiedenheft, who at that point was a graduate student, but is now a assistant professor um, working on CRISPR-Cas systems at the University of Montana. And then I was very fortunate to be able to go to Kamchatka, also in 2000, to visit a place called the Valley of the Geysers. This is a place in the world where there are about as many geysers as there are in Yellowstone that was only found by, um, at that point, Easterners, because it's in, um, actually, no, Westerners, because it's in very far eastern Russia, um, in the mid-1940s. So um, very, very isolated. There are about 10 times as many bears as there are people on the Kamchatka Peninsula, also 43 active volcanoes. Um, after the term, we can have some fun Kamchatka stories. But basically what you do is you find an appropriate condition there. What I didn't mention is that Sulfalobus grows optimally at 80 degrees Celsius and pH 3, so similar conditions to that tomato soup pool I was showing you before. Um, and basically you collect samples, you bring back to the lab, you look to see if there are viruses in them. And this has been done now for the original isolate from the southern part of Japan. We now have three isolates from Kamchatka here in the very far eastern part of Russia. Only people who know where Kamchatka is, people who used to play Risk. Um, and Iceland, a wonderful place to collect these viruses. Um, SSV, now called SSV-10. Um, David Goodman's been working on this one from Lassen Volcanic National Park in Northern California. And then a couple from Yellowstone as well. So why do we sample in these places? Otherwise, then that they're beautiful and wonderful places to go and visit. Uh, because what we want to do is compare all of these viruses to each other. So if we can find genes that we find in all of these different viruses, they're probably going to be important for making that particular virus. We can find genes that are not present in all of these viruses. Those are likely to be a lot less important for how the viruses are functioning. And somewhat to our surprise, what we found was about half of the genes are not present in all of the viruses, and about half of the genes are or in almost all of the viruses. And that's just shown here. This is a paper from my lab from last year. If you now look at, this is a comparison of 11 different SSVs from all over the world. Um, if this particular gene is present in 11 of these genomes, so all of them, it's labeled in black. If it's present in only one, and in this case, SSV1 from Japan, it's labeled in gray. And hopefully you can see there's a big area of black up here and an area down here where it's gray or a lot less so in a number of cases. Um, there are a couple of really weird things that you notice here, hopefully. Um, VP2, one of those virus proteins, it doesn't seem to be very well conserved which is kind of strange. Um, it turns out it's a DNA binding protein that we thought was important for positive supercoiling. Probably actually not in retrospect. It's not present in very many of them. Um, on the other hand, the integrase is present in all of these viruses. Strangely enough, there's a VP4 gene, which is also a structural protein, probably part of the tail. Um, it's not present in all of them. There are two that actually have alternative proteins um, for looking at this. At the same time, we, and when I say we, mostly my graduate students, have developed techniques for doing mutagenesis. And those of you who are in the mutant viruses from Hell Lab know all about this. Um, we've done mutagenesis now in all of the putative genes of SSV1. And to show that here, anything that is green means that if we make a mutation in that particular gene, it's still infectious. And if we make a mutation in one of these genes that's shown as red, it's non-infectious. These are deletions. So this, for instance, is a deletion. This is a deletion here. We've also done insertional mutagenesis, and that's what the lab is doing. Um, green means you can insert a transposon here. Red means you can't insert a transposon here. And what should hopefully be relatively clear, back up a slide. Oops. That'll work. Try going back here. Uh, uh, wrong way. There we go. Uh, about this half of the genome is pretty black. It's well conserved. And this half of the genome is pretty red in terms of not being able to mute make mutations there. One very strange thing that we saw, and if you're more interested in this, 
read the paper. Um, happy to share it with you. Is this VP3 gene that we were actually able to delete and still get functional virus particles, but they're a little weird. Um, in fact, um, forget, I think maybe data came up with this. Um, if you now delete the VP3 protein relative to these wonderful lemon structures you have in the wild type, here these are much more elongated. And in fact, one of the terms that he didn't use in his defense is the doobie virus, because these are these long elongated particles. Um, again, just lacking one of those structural proteins. To summarize what we saw here, um, looking at genetics and genomics, and this should actually be SSV1, although since then we've also done similar work with SSV10. Again, this one from Lassen Volcano National Park. Only about half of the genes are present in all of the different viruses that you find from different parts of the world, and only about half of those genes are actually essential. And even some of those conserved genes you can get rid of, but you end up with very bizarre looking particles. And this is one of those bizarre looking particles um, right here. So we're still trying to figure out what a lot of these genes do. Right now it's very much showed red and green. Again, apologies to those of you who may be colorblind, but uh, they work or they don't work. The real next question is how quantitatively similar or dissimilar are they to each other? And then, of course, as I have been kind of beating on for a while, what is it about these structures? And how do we know more about these structures? So together with Mark Murray at the UT Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, where they also have that cool BSL-4 lab. Um, this is not a BSL-4 um, virus because it doesn't infect humans. Uh, we did a cryo-EM reconstruction of our favorite virus. And that's what we got this 3D printed structure from. Stanley, as we call them, I guess, maybe now. Um, the virion um, came from this cryo-EM reconstruction. And here it's a little narrower, only about 43 um, nanometers across by um, about 80 to 90 nanometers in length um, and has this wonderful structure. If you zoom into this structure and squint a lot, um, you could try and convince yourself it's actually made up of lots of hexagons and pentagons. And again, this is just a model of what we think this might be looking like. And we were very excited about this. And when I say we, this is all the work that was done by my collaborators at UT Medical Branch, because in some ways it kind of looks like two HIVs, and this should actually be capsid, not nucleocapsid, sorry, um, kind of squished together end to end. And so say like the bottom would be one of these HIV capsids and the top would be another one of these HIV capsids. And this is a particular structure called fullerene cone, which is a larger classification of icosahedral-like particles. So an icosahedron is also a fullerene cone, but it's a really regular one. And here basically what you've done, you've taken an icosahedron and stretched it at both ends. And so that's the idea of what we think this structure actually looks like. We do not know if this is a reasonable model, but at least it's a model which we can test. And we're in the process of trying to test that um, right now. So <clears throat> finish up on Fusella viruses. Again, they've got this integrase. They've got a bunch of genes that we have absolutely no idea what they do. But at least we're now beginning to understand which ones are essential for virus function and which ones are not essential for virus function. We clearly need to go and collect a whole bunch more in some exciting places where we haven't collected things from hot springs yet um, to do some more of these comparative analyses. Um, you do find these really pretty much worldwide. And the structure is really pretty amazingly flexible. It's highly unusual that you have a virion where you can change the structure but still have infectivity. And quite what that means, we're not entirely sure. And we're, again, trying to trying to tweak some of this apart. So more questions on SSVs. Again, could easily spend maybe not a whole term talking about SSVs, but we spent a whole term in the mutant viruses from hell working on them. So, um, and yeah, 20 some years. Yes. Uh, the half of the genome that is not required, what, do they, what functions do they 
<laughs> so um, the question is, um, the half that's not required, what functions are being controlled by those genes that are in half of the genome? The answer is, we really don't know. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're trying to figure out. Um, is it something to do with copy number control? Does it have something to do with host ranges? Which particular sulfolobus can it affect? Maybe there are little tiny differences between the different springs. Um, that you know, one is a slightly higher pH, so you need this gene for that one, a different gene from another one. There are also is probably host defense mechanisms. I didn't talk about this here, but David talked a little bit about this in his master's thesis defense. Turns out there are CRISPR-Cas systems for virus resistance to, um, I should say, cellular resistance to virus infection, but then there also seem to be anti-CRISPR-Cas systems. So an anti-antiviral system. So, but what a lot of those genes are doing, we really don't know. And so there's um, a lot more work to do <laughs> to try and figure out what's going on there. And we have, again, we're in the process of now trying to get some quantitative analysis to give us a bit more idea. Maybe there's some changes in transcription. Um, a lot of the proteins that are there are predicted transcriptional regulators, predicted DNA binding proteins. So what happens to the virus on infection with some of these mutants? We really don't know. We've got a lot to do. Everyone's got their clickers? At least some of you are grabbing them already. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> this one, again, everyone's going to get 100%. Uh, -huh. <laughs> oh, this, by the way, should be capsid, not nuclear capsid. I had a couple of HIV researchers tell me that that's, you know, shouldn't be calling it that. Any more votes? 47 people here today. Next Tuesday are likely to be a few more. Yay! And I agree with you. <laughs> so, and yeah, that was probably pretty obvious when I told you that this was wrong. So, uh, <clears throat> mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa. I will try not to have typos like that on the final. Um, And if I do, people will um, get credit for that. So um, finish up, which again will take us about half an hour, um, sort of skimming through some of these other families of viruses that really deserve lectures in and of themselves for each one. Um, the Lipotrix viruses, which I mentioned already, have these um, long filamentous structures. What I didn't mention is how long they actually are. These virions are almost two microns in length. Considering that they infect cells that are only about a micron in diameter, that means that the virion is twice as long as the diameter of the cell that they're infecting. And if you look at infected cells, um, you see that they're um, really very, very unhappy. Uh, they, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, have these nano-sized claws at the end of the virion. These interact with pili that stick to uh, the outside of sulfolobus. Again, the, um, this is sulfolobus islandicus. So where'd they find it? Iceland. Filamentous virus, again, ridiculously creatively named. This is the Acidianus filamentous virus. Acidianus is a very close relative of sulfolobus, also grows at very low pH, not surprisingly, and high temperatures. Um, all of them have this kind of structure. Their genomes are quite interesting as well. They have these inverted terminal repeats at either end of the genome. They're double-stranded DNA, uh, but linear, quote unquote, but they have these covalently closed ends, rather like what you see with the pox viruses and a number of the nuclear cytoplasmic large DNA viruses. 
Um, what's different about these is that the ends themselves have this repeated structure. So it's not only an inverted terminal repeat. So each end is going to be complementary to each other. Probably important for replication. Replication here probably happens in a very similar way to what happens in pox viral genomes. But they also have these telomere-like repeats um, at the end of each of the genomes. What that means, how they're made, we really have no idea. My favorite virion morphology, the Acidionis bottle-shaped virus, ABV, again, ridiculously creatively named, um, also found from an Acidionis isolate, again, high temperature, low pH environments, um, has this really amazing again champagne bottle or popper like structure. Also has these filaments um, at one end of the virion. I think they kind of look like birthday candles probably because of the false color um, that they have here at the end of the genome. This is a cartoon of how the researchers think these are put together. Um, seems to be a coil of DNA around a cone like structure um, with a bit of a membrane around the outside. Um, they're quite large, about 230 um, nanometers in length, and again, these 20 filaments um, around in a circle at the base. The genome itself um, contains a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. In fact, it's one of the very few of these viruses that actually has their own DNA polymerase. Most of them don't. Um, seems to be protein-primed, um, a lot like a number of other virions that we've talked about. So who's up? Um, for this next, genes in Spain, um, Amy. So what other DNA viruses we talked about that protein prime replication? You do not recall. Who's, who's next on our list? Aspen, Lindsay, protein prime replication DNA viruses? I haven't started studying yet. No, it's not the exam's not until Tuesday. Give you a hint. It'll be on the, I'll, this particular one will be on this, this next exam. So, adenovirus. It's protein prime replication. Um, how do these viruses get inside of cells? Is it the fibers at one end? Or is it the cork end of the bobble? Not entirely clear. Um, we think that it's probably the cork end um, whereby they enter the cell. Unfortunately, these particular virions are very, very hard to work with. And in fact, they were lost for a number of years. But recently, people found new virions that look very similar in Yellowstone National Park. These were originally found in Italy, um, just outside of Naples. Um, but those samples, for whatever reason, um, were lost. Now we do have some new ones from Yellowstone. We're very interested in trying to find some of these in some of our high temperature, low pH environments. And in fact, the environment where George Kaysen talked about those single-stranded DNA viruses, the RNA-DNA hybrid or the Cruci viruses, that particular environment we found sequences that look like some of the sequences from some of these viruses. We've yet to see any particles, um, any virions that actually look like this. Again, kind of jumping all over the place here in terms of different virion morphologies. <clears throat> the globuloviruses, um, again, kind of look like blobs or spherical viruses. These now infect a different kind of yet still Crenarchaea, but these are organisms that grow at very high temperatures, but at moderate pHs. Um, Pyrobaculum is a whole group of organisms that are found in marine or circummarine hot springs, um, also have these unique viruses that are associated with them. Um, the virions themselves are not particularly unique, but they have very strange genomes, um, and in this particular case, Almost all of the open reading frames are in one strand. So why you have all your open reading frames on one strand versus on the opposite strand? It seems like a very strange strategy. 
we of course have no idea why this is. The answer of course is evolution, whenever why is happening. Uh, but probably has something to do with the way you have transcription. So you just have one promoter, for instance, at one end of the genome, which will transcribe all of these genes. Again, that's a lot of hand waving um, at this particular point. The B. contaviridae, which I mentioned before, is one of the new families. Um, these are fascinating because they kind of look like our favorite virus, uh, but much more so because instead of having one tail, they actually have two tails, um, one at either end of the virion, and they're also much larger than our favorite um, SSVs. Um, and that in and of itself is interesting, but probably the most interesting is when you isolate virions, you end up with some of these that look a lot like SSVs, but if you just let them sit at 70 degrees, they end up growing these tails at either end of the virion. And this is very, very strange because, you know, viruses don't have their own metabolism. At least the virions don't. You know, when they're inside cells, yes, certainly they do. But the virion itself is supposed to be inert, right? That's what we all learned about virions. But these are changing their shape. In the absence of any cells, any kind of metabolism whatsoever. So what seems to be happening here is there's a protein, and we know what it is in the genome, that undergoes a conformational change at high temperature whereby these tails grow. And one of the things that is unfortunately not obvious from these pictures right here is that the volume of the virion actually stays the same. So if you go from this virion here, the low temperature form of the virion, heat it up, this middle piece gets smaller and smaller, and the ends just grow longer and longer. And it turns out that this structure, it's only this one which is infectious. These guys are not infectious. And that's probably a response to a lot of the hot spring environments that the host and these viruses are present in. I showed you those pictures, you know, high temperature, low pH. One of the things about these environments is they're incredibly variable. Um, you've probably heard a lot about what's happening on the big island of Hawaii right now. Lots of lava, which is too hot for these things, um, but many earthquakes. Um, and what happens there is a lot of the plumbing changes. And so you can have a hot spring that one day is at 80 degrees Celsius, and the next day will be at 30 degrees. And then the day after will be 80 degrees again. And so potentially this is a virion state that can sort of wait around until the conditions are correct so that it can then infect or likely to be more hosts around to be able to infect. Again, a lot of this is hand waving, but um, pretty obvious that you have this conformational change that happens um, in these virions. Um, they also have these claw-like structures um, at the end, probably important for interacting with the cell. Um, these claw-like structures are actually present here, but they don't seem to be able to interact unless they're at the ends of these um, expanded virions here. Another virion that people found, um, and when I say people, this is actually one of my colleagues, um, Tomohiro Mochizuki, who's now in Japan but was working in David Prangishvili's lab in France. Um, these really amazing virion morphologies, um, here's an example down here, here are a few more of them, that really look like these coil-like structures with little projections at either end. And here's another blow up of this, projections at either end, but clearly a coiled-like structure here. When they isolated these, these are now from an organism called Aeropyrum. Again, high temperature but moderate pH, Crenarchaea. These found the genome to actually be a single-stranded DNA virus. Now this is very, very strange because aeropyrum goes optimally at 90 degrees Celsius, and we were talking about positive supercoiling for keeping strands together. Well, now we've got something that's single-stranded and, and seems to be happy at 90 degrees Celsius. How 
it keeps its DNA stable under those conditions is really not clear at all. And it's 25,000 bases. So this is way larger than any of the other single-stranded DNA viruses. When George talked about those cruciviruses or circoviruses or Gemini viruses, those are at most 5 kb. So what's this 25 kb single-stranded DNA virus doing? Who knows? It's there. It infects. It's a virus. What else? Who knows? The <clears throat> now I want to talk more about some of the structures. We actually know a bit of a high resolution structures on a few of these viruses. The Rudy viruses, this is the rod shaped set of viruses. Again, Sulfolobus islandicus. Many of these were actually isolated from that trip that I showed you the picture of with Wolfram Zillig and David Prangishvili and Ingelor Holtz. Um, they basically went to Iceland for, I think it was three months, and collected samples, brought them back to a lab in Reykjavik, um, and grew up all of their isolates from there. So they found these lemon-shaped viruses there, but also many of these rod-shaped viruses and also the filamentous viruses as well. Um, SIRV1 and SCRV2, also linear double-stranded DNA viruses with closed hairpin ends. This should sound really familiar based on our pox viruses, our nuclear cytoplasmic large DNA viruses, and the Lipotrix viruses, again linear with these closed hairpin ends. Um, one of the really fascinating things about the sequence of these viruses when they were originally sequenced, um, normally if you have a closed hairpin end, you've got a couple of bases that are not paired. We looked at this when we talked about the pox viruses. Um, here it looks like the base pairing could go to the very end of the genome. But there's no way that you can have um, one phosphodiester bond and go from one strand to the other. There's not enough space. So what this means about what the structure of the ends look like is a really um, interesting question. Also, long inverted terminal repeat structures. Um, these guys are particularly interesting because they've got extremely high mutation rates. And why that is, again, is not terribly clear. But if you purify these virions, again, long rod-shaped virions with tail fibers at either end, um, if you just grow these for a couple of generations, you'll have a, between 3 and 4% nucleotide changes in that period of time, which is unheard of for DNA viruses, particularly for double-stranded DNA viruses. So what's happening there and why they have these high mutation rates is really not clear. Um, they have also relatives in Acidianus, as well as you have these relatives in Sulfolobus islandicus. So, Genome structure, very interesting, long rod-shaped viruses. If you look at the capsid protein here, it seems to be wrapped around the outside of the nucleic acid, which should look really similar to a virus we talked about way, way, way back. TMV, exactly, tobacco mosaic virus. It's a very similar structure. Of course, it's an RNA virus, not a, a DNA virus. Um, so. One of the nice things about these helical structures is they're incredibly symmetric. So you can use a number of tools to try and get a higher resolution structure. And this was done um, a couple of years ago now um, by David Prangishvili's group in collaboration with a group at the University of Virginia. And what they were able to do was to discern the structure. It's a little hard to see here, but each of this, here's a yellow and a green these are the major capsid proteins of SIRV that line up with each other in order to form that helical structure around the DNA. And this was a high enough resolution structure. They could also see the DNA, which was present in these structures. And it turns out that that DNA is actually A-form DNA, not B-form DNA. So B form, nicely stacked base pairs, Watson and Crick, Nobel Prize, et cetera. Um, the A form, I'll get to this in a second, is a more compacted form where the base pairs are really shifted relative to the backbone. Um, but that seems to be a compaction which first 
is probably stabilizing the DNA from denaturing, again, at these high temperatures. Again, they're sulfalobus viruses, acidianus viruses, um, but also allowing it to have a relatively tight spiral, which is what's present on the inside of each of these virions. Yeah? Yeah, so the question is, um, does um, SIRV self-assemble like um, TMV does? I don't know is the answer to that question. One of the things that these have that TMV doesn't are these tail fiber structures. They're actually present at both ends of the genome. And I'm not sure if uh, you can try, you can get those capsid proteins bound to the DNA um, in these absence of tail fibers. Um, I don't know if those experiments have been done. As far as I know, they haven't been. Um, all of these experiments were done with purified um, virions. That's a great, great question. I, I just don't know if it's been done. OK, so a form DNA. So the last of our clicker questions, last clicker question of the term, oh no, sniff. Nobody liked SSV1. So sad. Um, yes, Acidianus bottle shaped virus, ABV. Not quite 100%. So, <clears throat> oh, this is slightly out of order here, but hopefully you'll <clears throat> excuse me here. Um, this is uh, work that, you know, basically, again, I showed you that picture from October of 2000, right at the beginning, the tomato soup picture. This is one of the very first micrographs that I was able to take of these sulfalobus turded icosahedral viruses. Um, it was really kind of an epiphany when I was down at the electron microscope. Um, most electron microscopes are in these dark basements. This one was as well. Um, so just looking at that, and I was looking for these guys. And it's like, wait a minute. Um, these virions don't look like SSVs but they still look really cool. Um, so at first I thought it was a contaminant and then we found more of them and eventually again showed that it's a brand new family of viruses. So one of the neat things about working in this field is you actually can discover really, really new things. Um, so Richard Feynman was you know, want to say there's a lot of room at the bottom in terms of physics, also true in terms of virology. Um, we also found some of these two-tailed like viruses in Yellowstone, and then some of these with these really long tails um, in Yellowstone as well. And I'll show you some more of those after I put this new slide in out of order. Um, so <laughs> this is another Arapyrum virus. Um, this is now a very small double-stranded DNA virus. Um, this particular paper was published in 2017, but the structure here also is very similar in terms of how all of the proteins seem to be stacked on top of each other. Um, as you see with SIRV, but this reconstruction was unfortunately not high enough resolution to see the DNA. So we think it's wrapped around the inside here, but it's not entirely clear, but still we have this sort of helical structure together with these interesting caps at the ends of the genome that actually might be more similar to SSVs than the HIV structure, which is what we originally proposed in terms of the, the ends of the structures of the genomes. But 
what I wanted to mention is it turns out that there's a similar looking structure. If you look at this, there are a whole bunch of stripes of these you know, different colors, um, which are all these capsid proteins sort of lined on top of each other. And each of those is spiraled in among each other. Um, with one of those viruses that we found in Yellowstone, this is a picture of it up here, now this is a single tail rather than two tails. Um, if you look at this in the electron microscope and you look at the structure of the capsid protein, it looks as if this might have a rainbow um, colored, you know, appropriate for Pride Month. Um, here, the rainbow virion um, with each of these capsid proteins sort of wrapped around each other in a helix. This is one model for how we think these viruses may fit together. Um, I talked to the last author of this paper and he said, I hope we're right. Uh, but um, this is a relatively low resolution image of the virion. They just have a high resolution structure for each of the capsid proteins and think that they could fit together in a structure that looks like this. And, and we're wondering again, maybe this is more of a spiral structure rather than an icosahedral structure, which means we need a lot more viruses, we need better structural data. Last thing that I wanted to talk about was not the structure of this particular virus. We talked about this before, double beta barrel, um, examples of probably virus structures that have been around for billions of years, and these you know, wonderful five-fold axes of symmetry here on the outside. But the lab in Bozeman, Montana, where you know, I discovered this hiding in the basement one day, um, actually one evening, it was pretty late at night, um, when we saw these structures said, oh, well, what else is going on with these particular viruses? And what about the infection? And more importantly, the production step. They looked at viruses, or say cells, that were infected by these viruses, the STIV virus, and they found these really amazing projections coming off of the sulfalobus. Here are a few more of those. This is probably the beginnings of a virion right here. What happens in the infection process, or more to say the production of virion process, is these pyramids are formed and then after a certain period of time, those pyramids open up, kind of like a flower, and the virions come out. Um, this is a completely unique structure in terms of virus production, but it turns out that Sulfalobus islandicus rod-shaped virus, that Rudy virus, the A-form DNA that's all wrapped around, and this icosahedron with the strange fivefold axes, both have similar proteins, both of which form these pyramid-like structures. And that's been studied a little bit more, mostly again by David Prangishvili's group. Here's another example of this virion-like structure happens inside this pyramid, and then that pyramid literally opens up and makes a hole in the sulfalobus itself. And this is probably one of my favorite images of looking at that. This is now SIRV. Um, each of those particles is labeled here in red. And then all of these, also known as virion-associated pyramids, where they open up in these structures, and now this poor cell is producing all of these extra virions. Yeah? How is this different from the Stargate? How is this different from the Stargate? So the Stargate, which is yeah, we see on those nuclear cytoplasmic large DNA viruses, that's present at the five-fold axis of symmetry on the virion. This is now a protein that's produced by the virus, but is expressed in the cell. And it's also involved in virion release as opposed to genome release of the virion inside the cell. Um, the other thing which is different between the Stargate and these, these are seven-fold symmetric, which is really bizarre. There are very few seven-fold symmetric structures in biology. Um, you know, wonderful magical number, et cetera. But um, very few seven-fold symmetric structures, whereas the Stargate is five-fold symmetric because it's at the um, pentameric axis. Yeah, in the back. Do you have a specific function in the cell? The only function seems to be virus release, making a hole and letting the virions out. Um, and it turns out you can actually take these proteins 
and express them recombinantly in E. coli or in yeast, and they make these pyramid structures, which is really amazing. Um, in the E. coli and in the yeast, they don't open up, but they still make these pyramid structures, which is you know, absolutely fascinating. So um, this is kind of an overview of what people think, how they could be related to each other. Um, Uriarchaeal viruses are similar to bacterial viruses. Krenarchaeal ones are very different. Eukaryal viruses are very different as well. Um, and this is basically what we talked about. And I did want to have one more picture of David Prangishvili, whose group has really led the charge in isolating the vast majority of all these new viruses at the end. SSVs, SIRVs we had before. All the other ones are thanks to David and his group. So with that, review on Friday, exam on Tuesday, 8 AM. Forget not. See you then. <laughs>